Welcome back to part two of Daniel chapter two, a lesson I've entitled of kings and kingdoms. We've finally got to the part where we're going to see the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Remember, this is a flyover. God is showing us an outline of the ages, a blueprint prophetically of his plan to establish a kingdom one day that will be without end, that will be finally without sin. And God shows an ancient pagan king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar this blueprint for the future based on a dream that he has recorded in Daniel chapter 2, verse 29. As for you, O king, Daniel says, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this, and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Let's find out exactly what it was Nebuchadnezzar saw in this dream. Verse 31. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watch while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. It looks something like this. Now, this is an artist's rendering, obviously, of what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. He sees an image. And Daniel, unlike the other wise men, is able to tell him exactly what he saw. Imagine if you have a dream, and it's a very vivid dream. Now, most of the time we can't remember our dreams, or in my case, I might kind of remember a little bit part of it, sort of. But imagine waking up from a very, very vivid dream, and you go to somebody the next day, and you ask them, tell me what I dreamed. Now, if they could tell you exactly in detail, precisely what you dreamed, you would be amazed. <laughs> you would be impressed. You'd be like, how did they do that? Well, in this case, Daniel was able to do that because God alone, we've learned, is the one that reveals the secret things. And Nebuchadnezzar now discovers the true wise men of all the dozens of wise men. He had one wise man because he was a man of the word, a man of God's word, Daniel, a man who goes to the true and living God, not the false counterfeit gods the other wise men were going to. And he tells him exactly what he sees in his dream. And what he sees in his dream is the figure of a man with a head of gold and then a chest and arms of silver, a belly and thighs of brass or bronze, legs of iron, and then there's 10 toes of iron mixed with clay. And in some way, this would be a picture of what Nebuchadnezzar sees. Now, I want you to notice something about this image. First of all, notice the deterioration of the materials from top to bottom on the image of this man in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Mankind is not evolving up. Mankind is evolving down. That's the first thing I notice about this. Gold is by far and away the heaviest metal known to man. So you have a very top-heavy picture of what Nebuchadnezzar is seeing, a very top-heavy, very fragile image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The strength of the materials that make up this image progressively decrease from top to bottom. This image wouldn't be able to stand very long. It's very top heavy. The first thing I want you to notice as we get ready to see the interpretation of this dream, we're going to see it represents four Gentile world powers, non-Jewish world powers, kings and kingdoms that will rise and fall. What we're learning right away is they will all eventually crumble. They will all rise and eventually fall. See, the kingdoms of this world is fleeting. They're actually fragile. They may look strong for a little season, but eventually they all vanish away. And it's pictured, I think, in the very materials of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, beginning with the head of gold and, and, and successively going down from there in terms of strength and durability. Uh, for example, the specific gravity weight of gold is 19.5. Uh, silver is 10.47. Brass is 8. Iron is 
1.85 and the specific gravity weight of clay is 1.93. I want you to see the strength of materials of man's kingdom is actually very fragile, it's fleeting. You got a very top heavy statue of a man here that couldn't stand at all on its own. Uh, and we're going to see these kingdoms rise and fall as Daniel begins to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Man's earthly kingdoms are not lasting because they have the wrong foundation. They are very frail and they are very fleeting. And that is the history of mankind. My word, when you look at ancient history, clear up to contemporary current events of humanity, you see wars and wickedness and the stronger tribes making war against the weaker tribes and stronger nations subjugating weaker nations and one empire emerges that builds on top of the rubble of the empire before it and another empire emerges after that one that conquers that one that conquers that one and they all have one thing in common. They all rise and they all fall because all of them are built on a weak, fragile foundation. It's really no different than what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 7. When you build on the shifting sands of this world, uh, your life may stand for a season, but it cannot stand and last forever. It's all about the foundation of which it's built. Now, I want you to see the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel's first given the king the dream in precise detail. Now he's going to give the interpretation of that dream. Get ready. Hang on. Here it comes. Verse 36. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Here it is. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom and power and strength and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven... He has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Boy, the Bible's hard to understand, isn't it? I mean, it's just so deep. I can't understand any of it. I want you to see that we have symbolism right here in Scripture. And the Bible always defines the symbolism for us. I want you to notice something. The Bible's always self-interpreting, even when it uses metaphors or symbolism as you compare Scripture to Scripture, the Bible is always self-interpreting. It's of no private interpretation. There's no reason for you to wonder what is this hit of gold. Daniel gives us the interpretation, and right here you have it on the very same page. Now, it's not always that easy. Sometimes you've got to actually search a little bit uh, to compare Scripture with Scripture, but always God defines the symbolism for us. And so you have the symbolism defined right here. He's saying, King you're the head of gold on this statue, on this image of a man. The image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream illustrates the rise and fall of four Gentile world kingdoms. And we're going to see the first world kingdom is represented by the head of gold is indeed the Babylonian Empire. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar has been given freedom by God to rule the world for a season. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar now is receiving from Daniel, that the God of heaven has granted Nebuchadnezzar a season where he's going to rule the known world. And what we're going to see is that Nebuchadnezzar is a prophetic foreshadow or a type, prophetically, doctrinally, of the Antichrist who will rule an earthly kingdom during the tribulation for a short season. God will grant this man, the Antichrist, to rule the world. And all of this prophetically is pictured now by Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to see in the very next chapter, Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar is going to set up an image and demand everyone fall down and worship that image under penalty of death. Exactly what happens in Revelation chapter 13. You have now a man being worshipped, the deification of a man. What has Nebuchadnezzar done? He has deified himself. And he's going to command everyone worship this image under penalty of death. That's exactly what happens in Revelation 13. As the entire world worships, it says not the Antichrist, but rather an image of the Antichrist under penalty 
of death. Now, it is impossible to understand the interpretation of this dream except through a premillennial understanding of biblical prophecy. I'm going to, I'm going to show you as Daniel interprets this dream of four Gentile world powers that ultimately are crushed by the final power, the final kingdom that is to come, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is impossible to interpret this any other way except through a premillennial view of kingdom theology, a premillennial view of the end times. Now, premillennialism, what does it simply mean? It simply means this, that Jesus Christ will return literally and physically to the earth before bringing his thousand-year kingdom upon the earth. Before establishing his kingdom, the king will return. You say, no, doesn't everybody believe that? No, they don't. There are good and godly people, people of Jesus, that don't believe in a premillennial view of the kingdom. Uh, a trending view in Christianity is something called amillennialism, not premillennialism. Amillennialism teaches there is no literal, physical, thousand-year kingdom. That when Jesus returns, time ends, eternity begins. Amillennial, as in no Millennium. What they teach is that the kingdom is spiritual, not physical. The kingdom exists already in our hearts. And all millennialism teaches so much of the promises God has made of a kingdom literally will be simply fulfilled spiritually or symbolically or allegorically. Now, the problem with that view is this, that when God makes a literal promise, he doesn't keep it symbolically, he keeps it Literally. And so you have to spiritualize vast portions of Scripture that God doesn't mean to be spiritualized. He meant to be taken quite literally. For example, we're going to see in Daniel 9, verse 27, uh, Daniel speaks of a seventh week or seven years that remain on a prophecy of 490 years. We're going to see 483 years of those have been fulfilled. This prophecy is fulfilled 483 years or 69 weeks but there's still seven years that haven't been fulfilled. If there is no literal tribulation and no literal millennium to come, then you don't have any answer for what to do with those seven years whatsoever. Uh, we're going to see in Revelation chapter 20 how four times we're told that this kingdom is going to last for a thousand years, literally a thousand years. But if it's just allegorical, it's just metaphorical, it's not a literal thousand-year kingdom, well, there's another problem, because it also says in Revelation 20 that Satan will be bound for a season so that he can no longer go forth deceiving the nations. Now, if indeed we're already in the kingdom, how is it that 1 John 5, 19 says the entire world lies under the power of the wicked one? It certainly doesn't appear that Satan has been bound at all. How is it? The Apostle Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that Satan is the god of this world or the god of this age. See, it doesn't look like we're in the kingdom as yet. What it looks like is there's still a counterfeit kingdom ruling over the affairs of men and the kingdoms of this world. Now, I would suggest that we simply take Scripture literally when it's meant to be taken literally, and even when God uses symbolism and speaks symbolically, there's still a literal rendering and meaning behind it. Now, there's another view besides all millennialism called postmillennialism. What postmillennialism teaches is that the church goes forth, evangelizes all the nations, and when the entire earth has been Christianized, we usher in the kingdom, and then the king returns. It's not looking very good, I have to be honest. If the Lord is waiting on us to take the gospel to all nations and Christianize all nations before the king returns, it's not looking very promising. Of course, they go to Matthew 24 where Jesus said, then this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations and then the end will come. The problem is they're taking that out of context. Jesus here is not speaking of the church age in Matthew 24. He's giving the signs of the second coming. We're in the tribulation by then. Who takes the gospel to all nations? It's the 144,000 saved Jews of Revelation 7 who go forth evangelizing the nations, which is why at the end of Revelation 7, the apostle John sees not just the Jews and the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe, but he sees every tongue, tribe, people, and nation 
around the throne of God. They take the gospel to all nations during the tribulation and then the end comes. No, we're going to see in this chapter of Daniel 2 a premillennial return of the Lord Jesus Christ and then he sets up his kingdom that will be without end. Now let's look at the ascension of these four world empires that are foretold by Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Verse 36, this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Yo king, or a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you a ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Verse 42, And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron, partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now, I want you to notice, we've already been told, the head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian empire. Now, this was prophecy when Daniel interpreted this dream, but now we get the advantage of looking back at this chapter through the lens of history. And so it may seem like it's rather difficult to unravel the mystery of this dream, but it's really not a mystery at all because we have history. It's really not a mystery. Uh, what we have is four successive world powers, world empires, or kingdoms that will come one after another. Daniel tells us the head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. The chest and arms of silver represent the Medo-Persian Empire that would follow the Babylonians. We know from history that after the 70-year captivity, exactly as Jeremiah would prophesy in Jeremiah 25, God will punish the Babylonians for their sin, for their idolatry, and he will use another pagan empire, another Gentile world empire, to conquer them and punish them and establish themselves over them. That happens, we know from history, in 539 BC. The Medo-Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians, align themselves, form a coalition, and they will conquer then the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, represented by the two arms of this statue. We also know this from Daniel 5:28. It says the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. No mystery here whatsoever. We know it here from history and we know it from what Daniel says in Daniel chapter 5 biblically. So the chest and arms of silver represent the Medo-Persian Empire, later to be known as the Persian Empire. They would rule for about 200 years. They would be the reigning kingdom and empire of the ancient world. Next would come the belly and thighs of brass or bronze representing the empire of the Greeks led by Alexander the Great. And we know what happened to the Persian Empire. They would be defeated by Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire would come. Now we're going to see later on in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel is actually going to prophesy Remember, over 200 years ahead of time, 200 years before Alexander the Great would even be born, he's going to prophesy perfectly with precision the coming of Alexander the Great and what would happen after Alexander died. His kingdom would be divided four ways. It would be divided by his four generals, and all of that's going to be prophesied centuries ahead of time. Now, the legs of iron, not hard to figure this one out at all. Legs of iron would represent the Roman Empire. Iron has always been associated with Rome. You probably have heard of Rome's Iron Legions. And that's what the 
legions of Rome were known as, when they would be marching into war, they were known as Rome's iron legions. Not hard again to figure out why the legs of iron represent Rome. Not only were they known for their iron legions, but legs are made for motion. Legs are made for movement. It was Rome that would literally build international highways and they would expand travel like never known before throughout the ancient world as they would lay highway after highway and international travel would emerge. By the way, that would allow the early Christians to take the gospel indeed from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, what I want you to see most importantly about this image are the 10 toes. Successively going down from the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, now you have 10 toes of clay mixed with uh, iron. Verse 41, whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron, partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Now I want you to notice, the 10 toes represent a confederation of 10 kings in the last days, just prior to Christ's return. Now we, we know this from a number of ways. You cross-reference Daniel 7 verse 24, Revelation 17 verses 12 through 17. The 10 toes and Nebuchadnezzar's image in this dream correspond to the ten horns of this beast of Daniel 7. And the ten horns of this beast representing this last world empire of Revelation chapter 17. So you have a ten nation confederation of kings or kingdoms in the last days of Christ's return. Now check this out. The iron implies that in some way this is a rebirth or a revival of the old Roman Empire. The iron implies a rebirth of Rome, of the Roman Empire, but the clay implies it'll lack its original strength. The Roman Empire was the longest lasting empire of all world empires in history lasting hundreds and hundreds, some would argue for 1,500 years, even after Rome was conquered in the 5th century by the Goths and the Vandals. Uh, you have the eastern part of the Roman Empire, the, the Byzantine Empire, which was headquartered in the capital city of Byzantia or Constantinople. It would last clear into the 16th century, clear into the Middle Ages until it was conquered by the Ottoman Turks. And so here's what I want you to understand. Unlike the other empires before it, Rome was never actually conquered, is simply crumbled. Rome was never actually conquered by another empire. Rome simply collapsed. The implication is the Roman Empire, having never been uh, conquered, it merely crumbled or collapsed has never fully uh, disappeared. And one day, the prophecy is that it's going to reemerge or reappear in some other form. Now you have the iron of the old Roman Empire, but now it's mixed with clay in these ten toes representing these ten nations, a ten-nation confederation, the rebirth of the old Roman Empire, the ten toes representing ten kings who will submit their power and authority to the rule of one man, the Antichrist. Again, your cross references Daniel chapter 7 verse 24, Revelation 17 verses 12 through 17. A rebirth of some way of the old Roman Empire, the Antichrist in some way being a reincarnated, not literally, but metaphorically, uh, the reincarnated uh, Roman Caesar of sorts. So if you have the rebirth of the old Roman Empire, what does it tell us about this future ten-nation confederation of nations that will form the political power base of the Antichrist? Geopolitically, it's going to look something like this. Now, this is a map 
of the Old Roman Empire. Now, I want you to understand what is unique about the Old Roman Empire. First of all, it spans east and west. It was the largest empire in world history at this time, going as far east as the British, or should say, sorry, as far west as the British Empire, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the British Isles, and as far east as the Euphrates. So the Roman Empire spanned Europe as well as what is today much of the Middle East or the um, area of Arabia to the Euphrates River. Now, this is what I want you to see. The contemporary historic view of these 10 nations will be a 10 nation confederation of European nations. All right, but look at the map. That's not what it says at all, is it? See, historically, prophecy scholars teach this 10 nation confederation will be European nations. They get that from Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. The prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27 says, The people of the prince which shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, we know what people came in 70 AD and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary, speaking of the temple. That was the Romans. So the people of the prince which shall come, that prince which shall come speaks of the Antichrist. So historically, prophecy scholars say, well, he'll be European, uh, he'll be Roman, and um, it'll be a ten-nation confederation of European nations. But I want you to notice something. The old Roman Empire was both Euro, European, and Asian, as in the Middle East. What you're looking at in some way is the real estate of this ten-nation confederation. Now remember, you have ten toes. You have the two legs of iron that spans east and west, but now you have the rebirth of the Roman Empire in these ten toes. Could it be, and this is purely speculative, listen, I've said many times the best way to interpret Bible prophecy is once it's happened. All right, this part of the prophecy hasn't yet happened. We can see clearly the head of gold, we can see clearly the chest and arms of silver, we can see clearly the belly and thighs of brass, we can see clearly the meaning of the legs of iron, because that's already happened. That's history, but this hasn't happened yet. So, I'm speculating, I'm not saying this with dogma, but the appearance to me, the implication would be ten toes, five on the right leg, ten toes, five on the left leg. Right foot, left foot, five European nations, five Arab nations. And if indeed that's true, you can start to see why this political power base will be so powerful to make up the confederation of nations that become the power base of the Antichrist because he will control the military might and the military technology of the West. He'll also control the oil fields of the East. He will literally be able to control the world economies, He'll be able to starve nations into submission, oil still, and will for many years to come drive much of the price of groceries and gas and the world economies. He will either be able to conquer through military submission or he'll be able to conquer nations through starvation. You can start to see why in Revelation 13. The entire world says, who is like unto this beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now, I want you to notice a very curious phrase in Daniel 2 and verse 43. They, speaking of these ten kings that represent these ten nations or this confederation of kings, they will mingle with the seed of men. What on earth does that have to do with anything? I mean, this is one of those phrases in Scripture that most of the time we're just going to pass over and kind of move on because nobody really knows what to do with it. But I told you last time, God reveals the secret things to those that seek Him through His Word and through His Spirit. Not some arbitrary opinion, uh, you know, just pulling something out of left field. No, as you seek God's Word, comparing Scripture to Scripture, the Spirit of God reveals the secret things through the Word of God. There is an amazing clue right here in this strange phrase. They, these ten kings, represented by these ten toes, 
will mingle with the seed of men. Now this phrase implies these 10 kings will not be the seed of men, but rather they will be of the seed of Satan. They will mingle with the seed of men. Well, aren't they the seed of men? If they're the seed of men, that phrase has no meaning. They will mingle with the seed of men. No, the implication is they'll be of a different seed. Now remember, Satan has seed, Genesis 3.15. God cursed the serpent and he said these words, I'll put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. The woman's seed, speaking of Christ's seed, but the serpent has seed. What is seed for? This isn't metaphorical. This is literal. Seed is for reproduction. Satan has seed. What was going on in Genesis 6 and verse 4? Before God brought the flood that destroyed the earth. It says these words in Genesis 6, 4. It says, And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto daughters of men, giants were born unto them. Now, who are these sons of God in Genesis 6? that cohabitated with the daughters of men, and giants, the word is Nephilim, was born unto them. Again, it's not a mystery. If you just compare Scripture with Scripture, the big controversy in Genesis 6 is, who are these sons of God? Are they the sons of Adam? Are they mere men? No, you let the Bible do the talk and let your fingers do the walk. And as you compare Scripture with Scripture, you take the clear portions of Scripture and you use them to interpret the unclear portions of Scripture. Genesis 6, it's unclear. But it's not when you trace that phrase, sons of God, through the rest of the Old Testament. Sons of God, literally, B'nai Elohim. You see it only three other times in the Old Testament. Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, Job 38 and verse 7. And every single time in Job, clearly the context of that phrase, B'nai Elohim, sons of God, is angels. The context is angels. As a matter of, fact, uh, matter of fact, Job 38, 7 calls these sons of God morning stars that praised God and shouted for joy as they watched him laying the foundations of the earth. So who are these sons of God? They're not sons of Adam. No, no, no. They are morning stars as in angels. They were fallen angels who were cohabitating with the daughters of men and giants were born unto them a hybrid race. I've said many times, the Bible's not hard to understand, just sometimes it's hard to believe. And the inclination of modern man, even believing men that believe the Bible, is to take the supernatural out of the Bible. But this is a supernatural book about supernatural events and supernatural beings. And now you know why God destroyed the earth with a flood, because you had satanic seed, demonic seed, that was mingling with the woman's seed, hoping to water down the woman's seed so the promised seed of Genesis 3.15 could never emerge. But God saved Adam's race through one man, known as Noah. And when you look at the text, here's what it says. Noah was perfect from his generations. Why do you think God wanted you to know that? Because it was perfect from his generations, meaning in generations past in his family line, there had been no mingling of demonic seed. Now you begin to understand what this little phrase means, that they will be mingling with the seed of men. The kingdom of Antichrist will be composed of iron, and miry clay, or potter's clay. In the Bible, iron is associated with Satan, and clay is associated with men. Once again, let the Bible do the talk and let your fingers do the walk. And as you compare Scripture with Scripture, the Bible is self-interpreting, it's self-defining. Iron is associated with Satan, not coincidentally whatsoever. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 11, we learn in the days of Joshua as he was conquering the ancient Canaanites. He drove out, according to Joshua chapter 11, all the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, the descendants of Anak, who was a Nephilim. He drove them completely out of Canaan, except in three Philistine cities. One of those three cities was a city known as Gath. And 400 years after Joshua, a little shepherd boy named David would find a giant known as Goliath, Goliath of Gath. 
And when you look at the text, we're told in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 7 that the giant Goliath whom David slew had a spear made of iron. Why do you think God wanted you to know that detail? Because he was one of the last sons of the Nephilim, a descendant of the Nephilim, the sons of Anak. In the days of Joshua, as they're making war with these sons of the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak, the Anakim, they're known as. In Joshua chapter 11, Numbers chapter 13, remember the giants that the spies saw that Moses sent across the land came back and they said, we've seen the sons of Anak and we're like grasshoppers in their sight. The Anakim, one of them was a king known as Og. And as Joshua's army was making war against this race of giants, specifically Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 11 tells us a king known as Og, the king of Basham, remained of the remnants of the giants. And indeed, it tells us his bed stand, check this out, was nine cubits in length, 13 feet. Imagine a bed 13 feet long. That's a giant's bed. Now check this out. It tells us, specifically, Deuteronomy 3 and verse 11, that his bedstead was an iron bed. Why do you think God wanted you to know that detail? Listen, I'm convinced there is no wasted space, not one wasted word anywhere in God's inspired scripture. God is trying to let you see that he associates iron specifically and symbolically with Satan and specifically satanic seed that would lead to the Nephilim. Now, it's not hard to figure out clay. Clay throughout scripture is associated with men. And we can see it over and over again. Psalm 40 and verse 2, Job 419, Job 13 verse 12, Jeremiah verse 18 speaks of the potter's clay, that he is the potter, right? And uh, we are the clay. So it's not hard to figure out what's going on. The Bible, iron is associated with Satan, clay is associated with men. So you have these 10 toes, speaking of these 10 kings, it's a confederation, it's a kingdom that's associated with both iron and clay. These 10 kings born of demonic seed, iron, will mingle themselves with men's seed, clay. Hello, we are right back in the days of Noah which is exactly what Jesus meant in Matthew 24 and verse 37. But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. He says, as they were eating and drinking and marrying, uh, so it was in the days of Noah before judgment fell on the earth, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And I would suggest with this additional understanding of what was going on in Genesis chapter 6, we can begin to see what will be going on in the time of the end, the kingdom of Antichrist, it will be short-lived. It will be a day, an age, much like it was before the flood, back in the days of Noah, where you have demonic kings, Nephilim, that is now reigning over the sons of men. I don't know for sure what this means, but check this out. I know that every single Ancient civilization has in their oral tradition a story of gods from the heavens, coming from the heavens, cohabitating among human civilization, then going back to the heavens, promising to one day return again. Now, I don't know this for sure. Again, speculation, but I do know 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that for those that are left behind after the rapture, if they knew the truth ahead of time, held it in unrighteousness, meaning they knew the gospel but rejected the gospel, they had a chance to receive Jesus Christ but knowingly rejected Jesus Christ, they will be sent strong delusion and believe a lie, it says, so that they will be damned. They will follow the Antichrist. They will not be able to follow the true and living Christ. Now, what will be the strong delusion that they believe? There's going to be a lie that will be propagated all over the world to explain the disappearance of millions of people around the world at the rapture of the church. What will be that strong delusion? Well, I don't know for sure, but I do know that there is a man, for example, by the name of Richard Dawkins, who authored the book, 
the God delusion. He is an atheist, a world-renowned atheist, a very intellectual, very smart man who is an avowed atheist, author of the book God Delusion. When asked specifically how it is that mankind got on the earth, he said that he believes in a theory called directed panspermia. That is simply a smart way of saying aliens. What he believes is aliens, extraterrestrials, planted human life here, cohabitated among human civilization to advance human evolution, and has probably gone back somewhere to the heavens. Hello, that's exactly what the ancient people of the world believed. That's exactly what the ancient Sumerians believed that was building the Tower of Babel gate to God. What I'm trying to say is I'm convinced personally these ten kings, like they did in the days of Noah, and there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, as in the days of Joshua, as in the days of the ancient Sumerians who worshipped the Anunnaki, giants, human beings with supernatural powers, godlike beings, I'm convinced maybe possibly the gods return to the earth. They form the power base, these ten kings that will become the power base of the Antichrist, who, by the way, according to 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9, will deceive humanity, will deceive the masses through lying signs and wonders, miracles that lie. Yes, he will have supernatural ability and supernatural powers. Could it be? Possibly. What I do know for sure in this dream is that a stone is cut out of a mountain without hands, and it came crashing down onto the image, breaking it into pieces. And I want you to see that this is how this dream ends, and this is what happens in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It says in verse 44, in the days of these kings, these ten kings, represented by these ten toes, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation for sure. I want you to see that Satan has always desired a kingdom of his own, to sit on his own throne, but the day is coming. The rightful king will return, and he will destroy all the kingdoms of men, and then it will be the fulfillment of that Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And this is the final kingdom that will consume all others, and unlike all the others, it will last for ever and ever and ever and ever. Who is this stone? No doubt about it. This stone in this dream that is cut from a mountain without hands comes rolling down this mountain, smashes this image to pieces. There's no question who it is because throughout scripture, the stone or the rock is a symbol of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 7, Jesus said, build your life upon the rock, not the sinking sand. Matthew 16, Jesus said he'd build his church upon the rock. Some have erroneous taught that rock was Peter, but there was no doubt in Peter's mind who was that rock. He would write in his own epistle, 1 Peter chapter 2, four times he'd refer to the Lord Jesus Christ as the rock. He would say, come to him as a living stone. He would call him a chief cornerstone. He would call him a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense four times in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter himself would call, call Jesus the stone. Jesus is the stone cut without hands that will crush the kingdom of Antichrist and establish a kingdom that will be without end. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. In the same way that Moses struck the rock 
in the Exodus story and water flowed from the rock, Paul says that rock was Christ. And if you know him, Jesus would say in John chapter 4 that a fountain of water would flow out of him, a fountain of everlasting life. This is what I'm trying to say. The winds of the last days are beginning to blow. And if you are not anchored to the rock, you might get blown away. Do you know him? Have you trusted in him? Because if you don't, the day will come that it will be a day late. God bless you. I love you very much.